Hello, and welcome back to another edition of the Kale Ortho podcast. Today is January 3rd, 2024, and we're so privileged to welcome back our very own Dr. Victor Ortiz to the Kale Ortho podcast. Today's topic is acetabular labral tears and hip arthroscopy and a disease entity we describe as femoral acetabular impingement. Welcome back to the podcast, Dr. Ortiz. Thank you, Dr. Kale, for having me. I'm looking forward to having a good discussion about hip arthroscopy. Yeah, it's great having you back, and Happy New Year, everyone. Well, we're first going to start out by having Dr. Ortiz just describe the anatomy of the hip joint, and then we'll delve into what a labral tear is and what femoral acetabular impingement is, how we diagnose it, and how we treat it as well. Perfect. So um, I think everything is important to start with how the anatomy of any joint in the body is, uh, and it's, especially the hip. You know, I think it's uh, one thing that I'm passionate about, uh, and the hip is a ball and socket joint. And, and the, I always try to explain to the patients, just showing my hands, it's like a ball and a socket. So um, those are the bony uh, parts of the joint uh, that create that motion, that create that bony instability. But in addition to the bone, there's other soft tissues around the hip that are very important and that we have learned through time that treating them helps patients uh, with the recovery and symptoms. And that entails the labrum, which is that extension of that acetabular rim that provides stability to the hip. We also have some ligaments or the capsule. It's like that bag that covers the joint uh, that also provides a lot of stability and keeping that fluid in the joint. And that fluid that the joint has is very important because it provides nutrients to the cartilage and, and lubrication to the area. So there's a lot of uh, roles for the soft tissues uh, that are important as same as the bony anatomy. Yeah, the hip joint's a ball and socket joint, as you described, very much like the shoulder joint, right, which is a ball and socket joint. You know, the ball and socket joints uh, are joints that basically have a lot of mobility, typically, and because of the mobility, it potentially can be unstable. Like we described in the shoulder, you have a golf ball that potentially can fall off that golf tee, but in the hip, it's a little different, right? The ball is quite large, but the socket's quite large as well. But just like in the bone socket joint of the hip, there's static and dynamic stabilizers, right? Some of the static stabilizers include the bone uh, and the labrum, um, but in the, in the hip joint and in the shoulder joint, we have dynamic stabilizers as well, the muscles, right? So one of the uh, static stabilizers we talked about was the labrum. What is the labrum? So the, lab the labrum is an extension of the rim. Uh, and I think that you know, if we look at the hip, uh, at the socket of the hip, so that rim is, uh, has an extension that could be four, 10 millimeters in length. The labrum is made of cartilage, uh, is collagen. It's an extension of that socket that increases surface area. It also helps to contain the fluid inside that joint, right? Describe that fluid for me. It's called synovial fluid. What function does the synovial fluid play in the hip joint? So the synovial fluid is very important. It contains some of the proteins of the cartilage and, you know, they work with the lubrication of the joint and giving that nutrition to the cartilage that is so important to preserve the hip, to, you know, when you start losing those uh, characteristics of the fluid or you're losing fluid from the joint, those are the things that can lead to arthritis of the hip. Right. Uh, the fluid is like... Uh you know, largely made up of uh, hyaluronic acid as well, right? The lubrication, they have a lot of properties, mechanical properties, load absorption, but predominantly nutrition and lubrication to the joint, right? The analogy I often give patients is like the gasket on a car engine, right? You have the pistons going up and down these cylinders and the, the oil provides that lubrication so that the engine doesn't fail. Uh, but if that gasket leaks, you can literally blow your engine, right? Same thing in the hip joint or any other joint that contains synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is so vital for the lubrication, function, mechanical properties of the joint, but also for nutritional purposes as well. And so that labrum around that bone socket joint plays such a vital role in maintaining the mechanical properties of that bone socket joint, cushioning it, cushioning it and preserving it uh, to preserve it so it stays vital and healthy and does not deteriorate and become degenerative. Now, we talked about some of the static stabilizers, i.e. the labrum, which you said is mainly fibrocartilage, but the ball and socket joint is also a static stabilizer of that construct, right? So you have a ball on one side, like you mm -hmm. described, and a socket on the other side that you described. 
Can there be changes that can occur not only to the labrum, but to the ball in the socket that can be uh, detrimental to the hip joint? Absolutely. And I think that's where we can talk about impingement of the hip. Um, so there are two types of impingements in the hip that, that are very common. And, and the first one will be that the head is not completely rounded. So when the patient is flexing or rotating the hip, the ball is not completely rounded, so you're rubbing against the labrum. The second type of impingement would be in the socket part. So we have over coverage, or the socket is more proud. So when we have a socket that is more proud, I always try to make this analogy, right? Usually the, the normal coverage should be like this, but a lot of the times there are patients that are over covered. So when you're over covered, that distance to impinge or make the ball hit the socket is smaller, and that creates that pair of the labrum. Right, and that often occurs in a condition we call acetabular retroversion, right? Correct. So why don't we describe the version of the acetabulum? What, what is a normal version of the acetabulum so, so our viewing audience can get an understanding? So if we're looking at the socket, I, I always think that, tell the patient, you know, the socket is always looking towards us, where it's looking to the front. Uh, but there is this uh, different, and we, patients have different morphologies. They're born different ways. Uh, and one of the things that can happen is that the, the cup, instead of being looking to the front or the, so or the socket, it starts looking backwards. And that's what Dr. Kell just mentioned about retroversion. So when the cup is looking backwards, and you can identify that just from x-rays in the office, um, the patient, the distance again to impingement is less. So the patients are at risk of this type of tears or injuries. And it's very important to be able to identify them because we have no, not to only treat the tear, but we also have to treat any uh, anatomic uh, morphology or, or deformity that the patient has. Right, that acetabular retroversion uh, can result in that femoral acetabular impingement that we described. And by the way, this condition is called FAI, or femoral acetabular impingement, and we call it that because the femur is the thigh bone, the acetabulum is the cup, and you can get that mechanical impingement um, for the reasons that Dr. Ortiz already outlined between the femur and the acetabulum, and that's why we call it FAI, or femoral acetabular impingement. And this FAI, femoral acetabular impingement, may or may not result in acetabular labral tears. And when those labral tears occur, it ultimately often can lead to degenerative changes in the hip and hip arthritis ultimately as well. And by the way, I failed to mention earlier that Dr. Ortiz, Dr. Victor Ortiz uh, is our hip specialist. He's the chief of the hip service at the Kale Orthopedic Center. Dr. Ortiz is double fellowship trained, by the way. Uh, he's fellowship trained in hip arthroscopy and hip preservation, as well as sports medicine and arthroscopy. He did a one-year fellowship in, in Chicago in the area of sports medicine and arthroscopy, and then stayed in Chicago to do a second fellowship at the hip, American Hip Institute, also in Chicago, with a world-renowned hip arthroscopy specialist. So he, he did that second year of training in this relatively new field of orthopedics called hip preservation. So he was hired specifically um, many years ago and joined the Kale Orthopedic Center primarily to spearhead this cutting edge field in the area of orthopedics called hip preservation where we're trying now to save patients' hips at a younger age and prevent them, hopefully, from ultimately requiring a hip replacement. Uh, so it's, it's really been an amazing uh, addition to our practice having Dr. Ortiz with us. Uh, so that being said, we, uh, we talked about uh, these forms of mechanical impingement uh, ultimately causing labral tears. Uh, and another way of describing this in layman's terms is to basically say that uh, between the femur and the acetabulum, you can get these spurs. Sometimes we'll call them spurs. On the femoral side, we call those gross, bone gross uh, cam lesions. And on the acetabular side, we call that a pincer lesion. So you may hear your doctor talk about a cam lesion or a pincer lesion, but essentially we're discussing this condition called femoral acetabular impingement. Um, and so at this point, we should really talk about how the patients will typically present with these conditions, Dr. Ortiz. How does a patient typically present to the office when you're suspicious of this condition? 
So the most common complaint would be pain, uh, and a lot of the patients will grab their hand like a letter C, and it's called like a C sign. They'll grab their hand like a letter C, they'll put it around the hip joint area, and they said, that's, that's where my pain is. And, and that's the main complaint when they come to the office. They're always saying, I have this pain, uh, usually worse with running, prolonged standing, or any type of activity that requires cutting, twisting, pivoting, or deep squatting. And I always tell the patients, it streams range of motion, especially when you flex the hip or you rotate internally, like where you're, as you're, you're cutting, that's usually the most common complaint of patients. Hip pain, definitely. And I can't overemphasize enough that complaint of what we call the C sign. It's almost universal. Uh, it's almost pathognomonic for this condition. When patients, when you're assessing patients, and you ask them specifically where their pain is, they almost universally all go like this. They grab their hip, just like Dr. Ortiz described, and we call that the C sign. And they grab their hip sort of just like this. They, they go like this, it's here, it's here. You know, they're, they're describing the pain deep. And, and it's not in the front, it's not in the back, it's sort of between where your thumb and your fingers meet deep in the middle. That's the hip joint. A lot of patients come into our office and they think that this is the hip. They say, Dr. Kale, my hip hurts over here, or, or this is my hip over here. It can be, but it's more often than not, uh, pain in that location tends to be stemming primarily from the, the back. But the hip to the orthopedic surgeon is the groin. So when patients complain of pain in the groin, it's almost always secondary to what we call intra-articular hip joint pathology, a problem stemming from within the hip joint itself. It could be a labral tear, it could be water in the joint, it could be hip arthritis, we don't know, but typically groin pain, more often than not, is stemming from the hip joint itself and nowhere else. Would you agree with that? Totally agree. Okay, so they com complain of pain, but we described also that the labrum is associated with stability of the hip, right? It, it, it keeps the, the, the joint together. You know, we talked about the static stabilizers, so it's a stabilizer of the hip and it helps to stabilize. So if that labrum is torn, that hip's also going to feel unstable a little bit, right? Correct. So mechanically, the patients may complain that their hip is what? Buckling? Pop, giving popping blood. or buckling or clicking. They Locking. can even hear like a pop. They say like, listen, I can create this pop. Uh, and, and that can be a case. Yeah. And they're, they feel unstable. Like when they navigate stairs, sometimes they have to hold on to the side rail, right? So um, that can be another complaint. So pain. And again, that classic location that we described, that C sign, but also instability. Anything else? I think those are the main main presentation. You know, I think that 95% of our patients will show up with those type of history. And uh, there's a uh, another 5% that might have a different history. Right. And that's where, you know, we have to be a little bit more like aggressive. Just include all the type of diagnostic yeah. tests. Uh, that we might discuss down the road, but um, but absolutely, that would be the most common presentation. I agree. And then once you're suspicious of that, we can do a bunch of things on physical examination to confirm that diagnosis, right? Totally. What are some of those things, Dr. Ortiz? So I think the first thing that I would do in a physical examination in, is inspect the hip. You know, I think a lot of the times patients will be able to show you what's going on uh, just from a simple inspection. Then you have to touch the area. And there are a lot of areas in the hip joint that you can touch uh, Going on the way to the front, all the way to the back. You know, you can touch the hip flexors, you can touch the trochanteric bursa, you can touch the deep gluteal muscles. There's a lot of areas in the hip that can give you an idea of what's going on. Uh, and then the next step will be to examine the range of motion. You know, just feeling the range of motion of the patients can give you a lot of information, especially of that bony anatomy or that bony morphology. When when are you rotating that hip? When do you get a block? When do you get a stop? And that gives you an idea of what's going on inside. So examining the range of motion is very important. And then this, we, we have the, this classic exam, which is called a fader, or flexion adduction internal rotation. But what that means is that we are really recre recreating that position of impingement. We're flexing the hip, we're bringing it against the leg, against the socket and creating some rotation and that triggers the pain in the, in the patients if the labrum is, is the symptom that is causing the pain. Right. And for the most part, this is an anterior sided hip problem, right? It's always, it's almost always occurring in the front of the hip joint. So in, in the front of your body as opposed to the back of your body. And so, you know, uh, it's a condition that occurs very often in deep flexion with combined with rotation that he's describing. And because of that,
we do this classic quote-unquote impingement test. And that's what he was describing, where we take the patient lying down and we flex their hip beyond 90 degrees and combine that with what we call adduction and internal rotation. So just to demonstrate, I'll take this hip of mine and we flex it into deep flexion, adduct it and internally rotate at the same time. And that very often will recreate that mechanical uh, impingement syndrome resulting in exacerbation of the patient's symptoms. That will hurt because when you're impinging, you're irritating the torn labrum or further displacing the torn labrum, and that is a fairly classic test. So combine the history of pain in the front of the hip primarily, uh, where the patients say that the pain is exacerbated by squatting, for instance, or sitting in a, a low chair for a prolonged period of time, and then corroborating that with their physical examination where you flex them, you bring their, their knees together and you internally rotate that hip where it will trigger or exacerbate, elicit that painful response. That's fairly classic for an acetabular labral pair, tear or uh, the condition we described as femoral acetabular impingement. So that's really important. And by the way, the patients that get these labral tears are typically in what age group population? I would say anywhere in their late teens to the 40s and 50s, you know, the, yeah. any, anywhere around that range, we can see these uh, type of tears. Right. But in general, what, the point I was trying to make is we're, we're dealing with a younger age group population. We're not diagnosing labral tears in patients in their mid to late 60s, 70s and 80s. That's, that's typically a different source of hip pain in that age group population. And more often than that, that would be a degenerative arthritic condition more often than not. So we're classically diagnosing femoral acetabular impingement and labral tears in patients in this younger age group population. So now that we um, made our differential diagnosis, and for the most part, we're, it's way up there. We're thinking that this patient has a labral tear, femoral acetabular impingement. And by the way, before I get to the next point, does everyone with femoral acetabular impingement get a labral tear? And does everyone with a labral tear have femoral acetabular impingement? What's your opinion on that? Um, no, not everyone gets that. Um, if I think we have, we, we can have patients only with impingement, and we do imaging and we do the procedure, and they don't have a torn labrum, and the problem is impingement, which might lead to that down the road. But I think that with the technology that we have today, we have been able to identify a lot of things before they happen. But it's, they can happen one without the other. Yeah, and. Um are certain patients at risk for developing these uh, femoral acetabular impingement conditions or labral tears? Absolutely. I think that if, you know, I think looking at the technology, as I mentioned, all the improvements that we have and innovations, and when you look at professional players, all the studies that they have done with these combines when they go to the draft and all the x-rays that they take, you know, you look at hockey players like goalies for hockey, 90% of them will have femoral acetabular impingement. Um, if you look at all those soccer players, basketball players, football players, there's a high incidence in some positions and high impact, th things that require uh, a lot of cutting and twisting and a lot of pressure in the growth place when you were growing up uh, are patients that are at risk of having these deformities. Is there a genetic component? Is there a genetic component to this condition, would you say? I don't think, that I, I haven't seen anything identified to a genetic component, but there's absolutely a, a correlation between families. You know, there's a people that they have it and they have it on both sides. So there's absolutely something in the genetic part, but nothing that I can tell that yeah. is. Like, I mean, certainly there is an arthritis. So you would think you would deduce that there mm -hmm. probably is or will be ultimately discovered down the road. This is a relatively new uh, diagnosis in the field of orthopedic surgery, right? Right. You know, uh, prior to this uh, diagnosis of femoral acetabular impingement, patients just ended up getting arthritis and we told them that they had arthritis. But this may be indeed a very significant risk factor for those patients. And if we can identify that early, you may be able to save a lot of patients from needing a hip replacement down the road. That's our hope. That's the concept of this fellowship training that Dr. Ortiz uh, did for that added year. Uh, in the field of hip preservation, trying to preserve patients' own hips as opposed to replacing them with implants. That's the goal of making this diagnosis at an early age, and we'll talk about how we can intervene in effort to do that. What about um, patients that have ligamentous laxity, for instance, so young girls that are hypermobile, ligamentous lax, uh, are those patients at risk for any problems? 
Absolutely. I, I think that, uh, thank you for the question, because I think that's something that I emphasize a lot, especially when I'm talking to other orthopedic surgeons or colleagues in the, in the field. You know, I think that uh, that young female with hypermobility, you know, we have this Baton score where we're always checking the patients, how, do they hyperextend the elbows, do they hyperextend the fingers? That patient um, is at risk of having a torn labrum because they have instability or joint laxity. So that's a patient that whenever, if we decide to do a, a surgical treatment, we, we have to treat the cause of the tear, and, and that's the instability. So we have to make sure that when we're doing that procedure, we're tensioning the soft tissues. We have physical therapy making sure that they work on, on tensioning the soft tissues because you're protecting the repair. I, I think that, you know, sometimes I have heard that people said this, oh, no, this patient is a young female with a, just a small labral tear. I think that's the most challenging case because you have to fix the labrum, but you have to make sure you tension everything around that. If you go in there and you don't do that, you're making the problem worse. Yeah, I'm with you. We deal with the same issues in the area of knee replacement surgery. When patients are ligamentously lax, dealing with those patients with hypermobile joints that tend to go into recurvatum or hyperextension mm -hmm. of their knee, that's a scary thing. So I'm with you on that. So now that we've made that diagnosis, um, how do we confirm it? What type of imaging studies can we do to confirm the diagnosis? So there, there's multiple imaging uh, in our office. The first thing, and I think that what gives me the more information is x-rays, plain x-rays, where you can see all these. First, look at the space. How much space does this patient has? Then look at this bony morphology, look at the socket, look at the ball, look if they are, you know, have any type of, any of the type of impingement that we discuss. And, and then you can see how, how, how the acetabular socket is looking. It's looking to the back, it's looking backwards. So that gives you an idea of what to expect when you get MRIs or CT scans. I think the MRI is probably going to confirm our suspicion uh, from our physical examination and our plain x-rays. Uh, and it's probably the more this is the most specific testing um, to identify how the labrum is. Uh, I think that MRI also has a lot of utility in that patient to make sure that we don't have more advanced damage, more advanced arthritis. Sometimes these MRIs will show patients that have a full defect or a full hole in the cartilage or, or other uh, edema in the bone. Those are signs that there's more advanced damage in the hip joint, and, and that patient might not be a candidate for a hip preservation procedure. I think that all the imaging is important for us to really identify who's a good uh, candidate if they have to have any surgical procedure down the road. Uh, with respect to imaging and x-rays in general, are you just getting routine x-rays in the office uh, of the hip or the pelvis, or are you getting special views? And why is that important? Uh, we have a very specific protocol and it has special views you know we get the plain the normal x-rays we get a standing uh, because we want to make sure that when the patient put weight on it how the hip is behaving uh, and we have other views that really allow us to see you know x-rays only show you two dimensions so we try to bring different views to get other dimensions of how the hip is right. to make sure that we have a, a socket that is covering enough the ball or we have enough coverage at the ball so we can measure that in different angles to make sure that we're making you know the right planning and right decision yeah. of what the patient needs are you typically getting weight bearing images in the office or supine images we get both we get a weight bearing yeah. and a supine great and and then how about on mri what what kinds of things are you looking for on mri so in MRIs, we, we want to confirm, we want to make sure that the patient has a torn labrum so we can see um, the labrum in the MRI in different views. And you can see either a line going through it, you can see some blunting, you can see some intra-substance fluid, you can see some cysts. Uh, sometimes when you have a tear of the labrum, the fluid, the fluid from the joint will start leaking through mm -hmm. that tear. And so you can see signs in the MRI that confirm that that's the problem that's going on. I also think the MRI for me is more important in that patient that you know might be borderline between having a hypertroscopy or a replacement because you can, whenever you see subchondral edema, whenever you see any cyst in the MRI, uh, those are findings that are telling you there are there is more damage. And when you go in right. there, there might be more damage. And it's important for me to have a good discussion with the patient about expectations about what the outcomes are going to be uh, if we decide to go ahead. When, and when the MRI is showing more damage than what right. we see in the x-rays. And primarily, you're, you're looking primarily for just disease isolated to that one area of the hip, right? That anterior superior area on MRI. So if you start to see changes that are more diffuse in nature, like you're describing the subchondral cysts and marrow edema everywhere, different things like that, 
uh, or label tearing, extensive label tearing outside of where you get that femoral acetabular impingement, maybe you'd be thinking more along the lines no longer of hip preservation, but maybe hip replacement, right? Correct. So yeah, the anterior superior aspect on the MRI, that's where you're looking for your tear. That's where you're looking for your impingement. That's where you're looking for that early cartilage delamination. And I emphasize early because if it's more advanced then maybe we're talking about uh, that the hip is no longer salvageable but rather needs to be replaced. And so what is the difference between the labral cartilage and the hyaline articular cartilage and the changes we described the labral tear on the labral side but on the Acid, uh, but on the um, femoral head side, sometimes we see cartilage delamination. What, what's occurring there? So I think that there are different type of collagen. You know, one, uh, the, you get the articular cartilage or hyaline cartilage, which is a collagen type 2, uh, which is softer. And, and that's what you can see, some, some fraying delamination. And then you have the labrum, which is a, a harder, um, it's more like, a, like rubber. Yeah. Uh, and it's that, that extension of the socket, which is harder, you know, tolerates a little bit more pressure, mm -hmm. uh, controls really that load bearing and, and creates that strong suction seal of the hip joint. Uh, and it, they're different, you know, they, they, it's very important to really be able to identify them and, and in the MRI and treat them the right way. Uh, because that's, you know, that's the success of the procedure. All right. So it's just like the knee. I always go back to the knee. In the knee, we're talking about the meniscus, which would be analogous to the labrum in the shoulder and in the hip, that type 1 fibrocartilage. And then we have the cartilage that coats the end of the knee joint called hyaline articular cartilage, which is a type 2 collagen, that softer cushion that Dr. Ortiz was describing. And so the key here is to identify changes on the MRI that are consistent with our diagnosis, but not advanced changes. We don't want advanced changes. Once we start seeing degenerative changes from a chronic condition, it may not be a hip that's amenable to salvage anymore, but rather replacement. So we, the key is, when you're, if you're suffering from any of these conditions, you have to get in to see Dr. Ortiz sooner rather than later. So he can employ his skill set in the area of hip preservation in effort to try to save your hip as opposed to utilize his skill set in the area of robotic direct anterior hip replacement to replace your hip. We're trying to save your hip here. So uh, that's where we're at with respect to that. So we talked about x-rays, special views. We talked about MRI and, and the things we're looking for, but also there's this 3D cross-sectional high resolution imaging modality called a CT scan. And just like there are protocols with x-rays, there's also protocols specific for this condition, femoral acetabular impingement, where Dr. Ortiz is ordering a CAT scan for very, very specific reasons. Can you elaborate on that regard? Absolutely. I think, I think CAT scan is a very important uh, part of diagnosing and what is the theology, what is the reason why we're having these stairs. Uh, the amount of information that we get from the scan is, is amazing. You know, we can get exactly how much overgrowth you have in the ball, how much overgrowth you have in the socket, um, in out on the clockwise. We always like, like to look at the hip and the, and the socket as a clockwise, right? 12 to 3 o'clock is usually the area where you see those stairs. So we can correlate that to the CAT scan and see if there's an overgrowth in the ball in the socket. Is there an overgrowth in this ball that correlates with that and how much we have? Uh, also, I think it's very important what Dr. Kale mentioned initially about acetabular retroversion. We can get some landmarks from the CAT scan and we can calculate exactly where, what is the version, what is the acetabulum looking at. But and also more importantly, um, there's a component of rotation also in the femur. Sometimes there are patients that the femur will be looking a lot to the front, something we call antiversion or increased femoral torsion that can translate to people that in toe or out toe. So those things we can measure and are important because that might be the reason why the patient is having a tear in the labrum and you might need to treat that and you might need to just uh, take care of those things. Yeah, that was very helpful. Thanks so much, Dr. Ortiz. You know, just to uh, re-emphasize, the MRI is very, very good at looking at the soft tissue. So when we're looking for a labral tear and we want to assess the articular cartilage or the fibrocartilage of the labrum, MRI is the tool of choice. But when we're looking at the, the 3D reconstruction of the bony anatomy, nothing is better than a CAT scan. A CAT scan literally reproduces the 3D anatomy of the bony part of this condition, femoroacetabular impingement, whereas the MRI very nicely looks at the soft tissue component of this condition. The bone marrow, the labrum, the articular cartilage, 
and the soft tissues surrounding the hip joint as well. So both are vital in making a proper uh, diagnosis of this condition, uh, condition and also planning treatment. So now that we're talking about treatment, how do we first intervene when you make the diagnosis? So every patient that we make the diagnosis or we have the suspicion, we always want to start with, you know, they come with pain, so we try to control the pain and we like to use any anti-inflammatory medication, you know. Uh, we want to have the patient modify the activities they are doing. As we mentioned, this is something that uh, happens with extremes of motion, so we try to tell the patient, you know, stay away from things that require a lot of flexion, a lot of internal rotation. Um, then we like to do physical therapy. I think supervised physical therapy is very important. It's the standard of care of any type of joint pain or back pain or neck pain in the in the orthopedic world. Uh, it's something that we are big on and we emphasize that every patient needs to be in physical therapy. Um, working, there's 17 muscles going to the hip joint. There's a lot of them that we don't use routinely and that's where a good physical therapist start working with you working with the core, working with the gluteus, working, and a lot of these patients come back and the pain is gone after six weeks of physical therapy. Yeah. Um, so usually that's, that's the first line of treatment for us in our practice, and, and it's been a very successful. Yeah, because you did mention over and over again that the labrum is a key player in stability of the hip joint, right? So if, we, if we've lost some of the static stabilizers, we focus on those dynamic stabilizers. The muscles we can control, we call those dynamic stabilizers. We can control the muscles and provide stability around joints by strengthening muscles in physical therapy. We can't control the static stabilizers, the bone, the cartilage, the labrum, etc., uh, with physical therapy. Those are things that would have to ultimately be addressed surgically, surgically if we can't get the stability or the alleviation of pain or achieve our goals with physical therapy alone. So that's why it's important to distinguish between static stabilizers and dynamic stabilizers. Most joints, in fact, I would say all joints have both static and dynamic stabilizers. So we first try non-operative care, physical therapy, focusing on the dynamic stabilizers to not only provide stability, but also try to restore motion. This is a condition, it's called femoroacetabular impingement. There's a mechanical impingement going on around this hip joint that's restricting patients' range of motion. That's one of their complaints. They've lost motion, they have pain from the impingement or the tears, and we get them into physical therapy, try to restore motion, but also to uh, achieve that stability that we talked about by strengthening the muscles as well. And so that's one of the reasons we start with conservative non-operative care, physical therapy. We can also give them anti-inflammatories, right? Sometimes they have pain associated with it. So sometimes we'll give them anti-inflammatories as well. Sometimes you may not be 100% sure that the pain is coming from the FAI or the labral tear. Is there a diagnostic procedure that you can do to help give you some feedback whether or not um, we're treating the right condition? Because we don't like to treat x-rays, we don't like to treat MRIs, we like to treat the patient and make sure we make them better. So what is a tool that we can employ to try to get some feedback? So I think that the, that that's where a diagnostic hip injection is, is the way to go. Uh, I think that is probably one of the most powerful uh, tools that we have in in diagnosing the hip as the source of the pain. Uh, I think all first for the patient. For I think patients sometimes come to us and they say, "No, oh, I think the back is the problem. I think the right. it's a joint, this other thing." And I we tell them, "Let me give you the hip joint injection. Let's see what you get." And they come back and they're surprised, like the pain is completely gone. Uh, I think it's very powerful also for us as a, as a provider uh, because it can differentiate uh, is this is a back related problem? Is this a hip related problem? Is this an overlap where we maybe the hip is 60% and 40%? So it allows us to quantify what's going on to be able to, you know, first improve the, I think that those injections are really allow them to have less pain and be able to go to physical therapy and work better. Uh, I think that I have incorporated that to my practice because when they come in pain and they go back to the physical therapy, sometimes they come back in three or four days. I don't tolerate the exercises, but you give them the injection, they are able to do those exercises, they come back stronger and they come in a better way. But I think that the Power, power! How powerful it is in diagnosing mm -hmm. the hip as the source of the pain is probably the best test that we have. That's great. I couldn't agree with you more, Dr. Ortiz. But this brings us back to what we talked about earlier, and that is the anatomical location of the hip joint. So it's not a superficial joint. The hip joint is not on the side of your hip. It's a deep joint. It's in the center of your body between the front of your hip and the back of your hip and it's in the groin 
which is not a superficial joint. And it's important to know that because you can't easily undergo a hip injection in the office without um, tools that will help you see that deep joint. And those tools can either be the usage of an ultrasound or the usage of a fluoroscopic uh, x-ray machine that you that we have in the office uh, that helps you see that deep joint. It's, you know, there are certain joints in the body that are very easy to inject, for instance, the shoulder, uh, the uh, knee joint, for instance, but the hip joint is one that requires uh, the assistance of imaging in order to get that medicine into the joint. And one way we do that is with the usage of that ultrasound or what's called C-arm fluoroscopy assistance. And sometimes even with that, you're not 100% sure you're in the joint. So what we do is what's called an arthrogram. An arthrogram is when we take this contrast material and we first put the contrast material into the joint and perform that arthrogram. Then we'll see under C-arm fluoroscopy or ultrasound that the joint is distended because like Dr. Ortiz mentioned earlier, it's like a balloon, the, the joint is a balloon. And so we're filling up that joint with this contrast material and we'll see that contrast material contained within that joint. Once we know we're in the joint, we'll also look to see if there's an extension of that contrast material between the labrum and the bone. And that is that line he was describing on MRI. Sometimes you'll see that line fill in the space between the labrum and the bone, further confirming our suspicion for an acetabular labral tear. But then once he's in the joint, and we've confirmed that on ultrasound or MR, uh, on ultrasound or CRM fluoroscopy, and by the way, we have procedure rooms at the Kale Orthopedic Center where we do this uh, in these procedure rooms. And once we confirm we're in the joint, then he'll add the corticosteroid or the local anesthetic, and more often than not, patients will get off that table completely relieved of their symptoms right then and there, immediate relief of their symptoms. They feel markedly different. They're able to get off the table. They're able to walk up and down, rotate their hip, and for the most part, their pain is gone. And that gives the doctor feedback that we're not only treating a study, but we're treating the patient for the presumed diagnosis and we're accurate in our diagnosis uh, and uh, our impression of what's going on. So now you've done that and you got that feedback. Um, you'll get the patient for physical therapy like we talked about, and you'll see the patient back. If the patient's better, you're done, right? right? For the most part, you don't just treat the patient because there's a labral tear or femoral acetabular impingement, but there, if there's enough of a pincer lesion or if there's enough of a cam lesion, you're probably going to keep a close eye on that patient because you don't want that to ultimately number one, result in significant loss of motion to that patient, right? Because the, that pincer can get bigger, that cam could get bigger and they can lose motion. And we need to preserve motion to put on our socks and shoes and get in and out of cars, all those things. But also those, that mechanical impingement can cause the changes not only to the labrum, but to that hyaline articular cartilage, that delamination, which ultimately leads to arthritis. So now that you're, you're, you've made the diagnosis and you're looking at the patient's MRI, CAT scan, and X-ray, what are the changes on X-ray that would suggest to you that maybe if this patient fails physical therapy, you can undergo a definitive surgical hip preservation procedure versus x-ray changes that may ultimately say, look, if you fail conservative management, you're going to need a hip replacement. What are those changes you're looking for? So, so there are a couple of uh, criteria that we take in consideration when examining x-rays that really allow us to know if the patient would be a good candidate uh, to undergo a hip preservation procedure. Uh, the first one is how much space the patient has left. There's been multiple studies that have shown that if you have less than two millimeters of joint space, that's a patient that would, would, wouldn't do well with a hip preservation procedure. Will, will not do well, will right. Not do well. It needs a hip replacement. It would right. need a hip replacement. Yeah. So that's the first thing that you can see. There's a the classification of collatonic classification uh, where patients uh, zero and one are the good candidates. And the way you classify that is when you look at the space, you look at these, these bone spurs, sclerosis, all, all those findings. Right. So just from an x-ray standpoint, uh, you get that classification. You have to make sure that you have enough space and you don't have changes that are consistent with more advanced arthritis. Right. So what he's talking about is that ball and socket joint, that first x-ray. You're looking at the ball and the socket. 
And that space that we see on x-ray is not really a space. It's filled with cartilage normally. Well, you want it to be filled with cartilage. And if that x-ray is showing that there's less than two millimeters of space between that ball and socket, you can't save that patient's hip anymore. Ultimately, if that patient fails non-operative care, that patient's getting a hip replacement. But if that patient that you're suspicious of has a labral tear, has an x-ray that looks like this, and there's still healthy cartilage in, or surrounding that ball of the ball and socket joint, that patient, if that patient fails non-operative care, is getting a hip arthroscopy by Dr. Ortiz to save that patient's hip. That's that hip preservation. So that patient's gonna get, well, let's talk about it. it let's talk about that patient. That patient now went to physical therapy for how long? How, how long would you treat them non-operatively? You've given them a couple of cortisone injections. They've they got significant relief. You put them in for physical therapy. Maybe every once in a while they're taking some Tylenol or an anti-inflammatory, but they come back to you. When are you gonna see them back? When are you gonna make a decision to pull the trigger to take the next step? I usually like to wait like around six weeks. You know, we can go anywhere from six to 12, but I think six weeks for me is enough time for the patient to you know, try all the conservative management, all the all the non-surgical or non-interventional procedures, including the injections, including the medication, including uh, supervised physical therapy. Uh, if they have done that, you know, like for a good six weeks and the symptoms are worse or not getting better, I think that's a patient that will be a good surgical candidate. Yeah. And, you know, you're also listening to them. If they're complaining of constant instability, constant pain, constant loss of motion, uh, buckling, giving way, they can't navigate stairs, you know, every patient's different. So, you know, this is not like a textbook, cookie cutter type of approach. We evaluate each patient, listen to their symptoms and see, see how it's affecting their quality of life. These labral tears, we know, will never heal by themselves, right? This problem is not going to go away by itself. You can manage the symptoms with physical therapy and things like that, but it's never going to heal. What is your approach to the patient that doesn't want any surgical intervention? Are there any biological therapies, regenerative medicine techniques that you can employ to, to, to maybe inject into that joint that will give some biology that potentially can alleviate the patient's symptoms and plus or minus promote some biological healing? Absolutely, and we have a good amount of patients that they don't have, and you know, they are maybe later in, in age and they say like, you know what, I don't wanna have an arthroscopic procedure, I don't wanna go through the process, and, and we always have discussions with about platelet-rich plasma or bone marrow aspirate injections. Uh, I think they have a great role, they, they are, good uh, to decrease the inflammation. I think that it's uh, the evidence-based medicine out there, it, you know, it's not going to be strong enough to say that it's going to heal the tear, uh, but I think it, it brings all these cells, all these components that decrease inflammation and it will help with the pain. And so far, we, I think in my hands, I have had a great success of of outcomes with those patients. You know, we, one of the things that I did in my training of hip preservation was we did a case series of those, in those patients, a little bit different than was, those were patients that were not a surgical candidate because of that x-ray less than two millimeters or an MRI that showed more arthritis, and, and but they were not completely bone on bone. It was mm -hmm. not like a bone on bone patient, so we injected them with PRP, we followed them for a year, and all those patients have improvement in their, in their patient reported outcomes. Um, so I think it's something that is a, an absolutely a, a great option for those patients that don't wanna go undergo a procedure. Yeah, I mean, certainly the PRP or the platelet-rich plasma has some anti-inflammatory properties associated with it. It's something we offer routinely to our patients and perform routinely at the Kale Orthopedic Center. A little bit of a disclaimer, it is not FDA approved. It is considered by most insurance companies to be experimental, but a lot of patients uh, believe in it. And certainly that's where uh, medicine is heading and orthopedics in general is heading in the era of regenerative medicine, repairing as opposed to replacing. We do offer those technologies and, and anecdotally, we both can tell you that it's helped a ton of patients in our practice for sure. And so if, if uh, patients are adamantly opposed uh, to fixing the problem and they're willing to try uh, maybe some future experimental orthobiological therapies, regenerative medical uh, therapies and interventions, uh, we would be happy to oblige and offer you those services because we offer them routinely at the Kale Orthopedic Center. So now um, you've indicated the patient for hip arthroscopy. Uh, let's talk about uh, your approach to hip arthroscopy and what your goals are and how you achieve those goals. I think so. So once we identified that 
the label theory is what is causing the symptoms in the patients and we would run all these imaging studies, physical examination, conservative management, uh, we have to be able to identify what are the sources of the pain, what is causing the problem. And I think that we have to, a lot of the times, maybe 90, 99% of the times we have a torn labrum. Uh, but I always ask myself, why did the patient have a torn labrum? Was this because they have impingement? Was this because uh, they're having hypermobility, as we discussed earlier? Mm -hmm. So we have to come with a plan and to offer the patients, how can we fix this? But also, how can we avoid this from happening in the future? Um, and I think that's the most important thing in the decision-making process. Uh, in my conversation with the patients uh, about what are we going to be doing? Uh, mm -hmm. How are we really attacking this? Um, the goal, and I think that when we're offering this procedure to the patient, the goal and only goal for surgery should be to improve pain and functionality. And that, that's the main thing. You don't have pain, you don't need surgery. But if there's pain, we want to make it better. There's a highly a high chance if you fail everything we have done that we can make you better. And there's always a secondary goal that if we are preserve, we are fixing these problems, that we can preserve this, that we can win time and give you more time down the road before the need of a replacement or the idea to try to avoid it right. in the future. Um, so I think that, that once we have that, then we decide and we made the decision, the informed decision of going ahead with the procedure. Uh, this is a minimally invasive procedure that we do it through same as a shoulder or a knee, a simple uh, scope. We go in there, uh, we confirm the problem with the camera, we put the camera in there, we can take pictures, we can see the label, we can see the cartilage, we can see everything in the, in the joint. Uh, and then we go ahead and we fix it. And usually the first thing that I always like to do is go to that acetabular rim. And we expose that rim where we're going to be reattaching that labrum. We trim whatever impingement we have in that area, guided with all the pre op planning that we did because we got a CAT scan, we got all this imaging that is telling me, letting me know, doctor, this, this is where we're going to go. This is what, how much bone we're going to remove. Once we remove the bone, then we can put multiple anchors and, and as many anchors as we need. We can go as, 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 may, as low as two, we can go all the way to six, seven anchors whatever is needed to really restore uh, that labrum, to be able to create that function or that suction seal or that increased surface area, um, to restore the mechanics of the hip. And after we, we fix the joint, we, we clean everything that needs to be clean, mm -hmm. then we pull the traction off. You know, we, when we go to the joint, we have to open it up, pulling on the leg. So once we close that, we can really see how we restore that seal mechanism. And we can now go to the ball and look at that area that is causing impingement, trim all the bone down, increase that offset, increase that distance before the patient has any type of impingement. And we do that guided by x-ray, through x-ray guidance through the procedure to make sure that we get to that angle that we need to get. Uh, and also guided by the pre-op planning that we did from the, from the CT scan. Um, and once we fix everything, then we, we go ahead and something that I emphasize a lot is that we, when we get to the joint, we have to open the back. If we leave the back open, that's going to create problems down the road. We have to close that back, and that's called the capsule. So once we're done with the procedure, we have to close the capsule. I think that's something that has to be done routinely. Um, and sometimes in patients, we have to not only close it, but do something that's called a capsule application, where you put the sutures in a different orientation to tension that more, to protect that repair, because we want to really tighten the hip joint to protect the repair that we did. Yeah. Wow, so you've achieved a lot of goals arthroscopically. You've not only reattached the labrum, which was the source of pain, um, you took down the bone spur on the acetabular side, the cup side, you took down the bone spur or the cam lesion on the femur or the femoral side, and by doing so, eliminating that source of impingement, uh, your goal is to restore range of motion to that patient as well. And so now you've repaired the labrum, you've restored that watertight closure, that seal, the synovial fluid is now nourishing the joint, providing its mechanical properties of lubrication and shock absorption and nutrition to the articular cartilage. Uh, so you've achieved a lot of goals doing this through a very minimally invasive arthroscopic, <coughs> arthroscopic approach, typically through two or three puncture, typically three puncture, right. yes. three little punctures around the hip joint. This is very cutting edge technology. I, I, I must emphasize to you the, the lion's share of orthopedic surgeons in, this, in the world, not just this country, have never ever done a hip arthroscopy. Uh, this is a procedure that should only be performed by very, very highly trained and experienced uh, orthopedic surgeons like Dr. Ortiz. Most orthopedic surgeons would never dare to attempt a hip arthroscopy. It's very different 
than a shoulder arthroscopy and a knee arthroscopy that most orthopedic surgeons that do sports medicine uh, do. So you definitely, definitely need a highly experienced, trained, uh, and, and seasoned orthopedic surgeon like Dr. Ortiz, who, who does probably anywhere from five to 10 a week. That's a, he's a very, very highly um, experienced uh, orthopedic surgeon in the area of hip arthroscopy. Uh, and so I do need to emphasize that because most orthopedic surgeons that are dabbling in the field of uh, hip arthroscopy may be in fact just doing that dabbling and you certainly don't want to be a guinea pig so you want to make sure that you go to a seasoned experienced uh, orthopedic surgeon that has done a high volume of these okay so I, I do want to emphasize that and and specifically has done a hip preservation fellowship as well uh, because it, it is not uh, as easy as uh, as most other joints that we routinely scope. So I do want to emphasize that just to protect you. Um, so we've done the surgery, outpatient surgery, patients going home the same day. Uh, it's important that they protect your repair, right? What's your post-op protocol? So every patient, uh, the first two weeks is only putting their foot on the floor. So that means they're going to wear crutches. So only the, only the foot on the floor, we don't put up want to put any pressure in the area to not to damage the repair the only thing that we use routinely is a hip brace the brace will allow you to go from zero to 90 degrees so you're going to be able to sit in the chair comfortable but we don't want to open the leg we don't want to create any rotation in the leg for the first two weeks but you start physical therapy right away you know next day we have a very specific protocol for every patient next day you're in physical therapy um, then at two weeks we get rid of the brace we get rid of the crutches then you go back to full weight bearing uh, and then we progress you for multiple phases with the idea in four to five months for you to be able to go back to do everything that you want that's great and what have you found in your experience uh incidents of bilaterality do you find that a lot of these patients will have a tear on the other side too or develop a tear on the other side as well it's very common i always tell the patients that all the hip gets jealous and, <laughs> and, and it's, it's but it's, it's very yeah. common yeah. and not always i have to we have to treat them uh but i have done patients that i have done one week apart uh, i do one side and we go to in the week we do yeah. the other side uh, and it's very common. Yeah. Well, this has uh, been very helpful, you know, especially uh, a subject like this that not a lot of people know about, right? Femoral acetabular impingement. Um, you know, I think it's important to get the word out about this condition, even to non-orthopedic surgeons. First of all, a lot of orthopedic surgeons aren't familiar with this, this condition. And um, maybe they're not 100% sure what, what the source of that patient's hip pain is. Uh, what is femoral acetabular impingement? Again, I, as I mentioned, it's a relatively new um, disease condition that we've identified. Uh, but it's very important also to get the word out to chiropractors and medical doctors, primary care physicians. When patients are, ex are complaining of that classic groin pain, instability, buckling, mechanical properties, pain with deep flexion and squatting, and the x-ray is normal, uh, Think about femoral acetabular impingement. Think about labral tears. The pain where we described it to be is coming from the hip joint. And there's not too many things that can cause that pain in the hip joint. So when there's no arthritis, you know, you have to be thinking about this condition, femoral acetabular impingement. And if you're not routinely looking at hip x-rays and specifically the the very specific views that we order to assess for this condition, you may be missing the diagnosis and we're not doing any justice to our patients. So, it's a, so it behooves us to think about this condition and send them to an expert like Dr. Ortiz to, to get this condition assessed so our patients can be treated and maybe you might even be saving them from a hip replacement down the road. So it's very important to, to be aware of this condition. So I hope that you find, found this podcast to be beneficial and helpful. And uh, Dr. Ortiz is readily accepting uh, new patient visits and follow appointments as well, second opinions, uh, injury cases, and workman's compensation cases as well. So feel free to reach out, okay? So thanks so much for your time, Dr. Ortiz. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure having you here again. Welcome back. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye, everyone.